So I want to dig right into what really surprised you in this quarter because you were talking about this data economy being strong despite headwinds, but we knew that already. So was it the pull in on PCs uh, because of the China headwinds that caused uh, a bunch of that outperformance? What specifically was it? Well, it was a few things, John. First and foremost, we saw much stronger demand for our PC business and in particular for the higher end, high performance products, which gave us a higher ASP in the quarter. Secondly, our IoT business um, continues to perform very strong. Third, data center was basically in line with kind of what we expected 90 days ago. And fourth, pricing in the memory market continued to be a little bit worse. So you take that all together, and we outperformed our expectations on the top line by $900 million. Part of that was driven, we believe, John, from a bit of a pull-in from the second half to the first half in light of anxieties around incremental tariffs in, in China, which, as you know, is a big market for us. So all in all, strong quarter and sets us up well for uh, raising our guide for the full year going into the second half. Yes, and you also said that you expect uh, the cloud demand to pick up in the second half after they've been sort of digesting a bunch of that CapEx that they did earlier. I wonder how much of that is showing us a new cloud cycle. I mean, certainly we saw Microsoft uh, with their CapEx projection for the next fiscal year significantly higher. I, I guess that's what you're benefiting from. What, what does the cloud cycle look like and how should investors factor that in? Well, cloud has been a bigger and bigger part of our business over the last several years as we've had very good momentum. What we're dealing with right now is, you know, remember last year's growth for our cloud business was up 40%. So what happens is the cloud players acquire and then they digest. So our expectations coming into the year is the first half for cloud would be more of a digestion period and given their end demand continues to be relatively strong, that then they would come back and start purchasing in the second half of the year. That's kind of how we thought the year would set up, and uh, that's our expectations as we go into the second half. I do want to go back to PC demand because you guys mentioned that, particularly in commercial, it was strong, and I wonder what you're seeing specifically driving commercial demand for PCs, especially because there was sort of this narrative out there a couple years back that lower performance uh, was going to be required in the future because so much was happening through the web. You know, we've had a dramatic uh, transformation of the company where PCs used to be 70 percent of the business a relatively short period of time ago. And to your point, PC demand has come down for several years by roughly 5 to 6 percent a year. Over the last couple of years, we've seen some real stabilization, and we think it's a function of several things. One, just continued good products getting out into the market that are being adopted. Number two, we still are in the midst of the uh, Windows 10 refresh cycle. So we're seeing demand last year and this year to try to contemplate for that reset cycle. So those two things, high performance compute, driving higher ASPs, and the refresh cycle is what's been a fairly constant but strong commercial environment that's offset a more weaker consumer environment. Hey, Bob, it's Deirdre. I have a broader question. I know you said that tariff threats actually helped sales this quarter, but I wonder about the longer term. Do Chinese companies like Huawei ultimately become less dependent on U.S. chip makers? And not only that, but do you believe that they can create chips that could eventually eat away at your business? Well, first, I would say we're, we're somewhat encouraged that the two sides are going to sit down again next week, as we understand uh, see how they can talk through how to get more normal global trade relations back. So that's what we've been pushing for. We think that's important for industry overall. It's very important for the semiconductor industry in particular, which is a big net exporter to China. And it's really important for our business because China has been a very a big market for us for a long period of time. The challenge for us as we continue to grow is to generate the profits till we can re reinvest in R&D. And as we continue to reinvest in R&D, we're confident 
even though global players get stronger, that we will have the R&D, the products, the portfolio of solutions that's better than anybody else in the world. So with a global trade environment, China's a big market. We want to continue to sell into that market. And that gives us the horsepower to invest here domestically, both in terms of fabs and in R&D. And that's what keeps us ahead of the game. Bob, do you believe that other chip makers, Chinese ones like Huawei or ZTE, have the capability to make chips that are the gold standard that you and other American chip makers make? We think over time that there's a lot of people that want to get into the chip market. Um, that's not really a new thing. Um, and we believe over time that they will have the ability to. For us, the key in that increasingly competitive market in a data-centric world where there's more and more demand for compute is that we continue to make the R&D expenditures to make sure that we stay ahead of the game when lots of players want to be in the market that we lead. Hey, Bob, how relieved are you to have this uh, modem business thing out of the way? And where is the best place, where will be the best place be to invest th those proceeds? Well, first, uh, to the second part of your question, we're very excited about the role that we will play in 5G, and particularly in areas where we think we play in a key technology inflection, which is what we characterize as the cloudification of the network. That's where we're going to double down on, an area where we think we can really win and play a much bigger role in the success of our customers. For the 5G uh, smartphone modem, we just didn't see the opportunity to get attractive returns for our investors. So we're excited to um, uh, really double down on network cloudification as a place where we have a real, a real right to win in the marketplace. Bob, it occurs to me that what Apple is doing with smartphone modems is exactly what you don't want the mega scale cloud players to do in cloud, right? They're vertically integrating. They, they want to take that business and design a, a chip that's specifically for them. We're starting to see the cloud players do that. How do you keep them from doing it in such a way where you've got to sell off businesses to Amazon or to Microsoft 10 years from now? You know, it, it, John, it's the same, same answer to Deidre's question, which is how do we continue to invest in the R&D that keeps us ahead of the game in a world where we develop the technologies that has a real impact on virtually every aspect of, uh, of commerce. When you do that, everybody wants to be a part of it. So our challenge is to make sure we continue to invest in the R&D that keeps us ahead of the game. And along the way, we have to be able to customize what it is that we do that meets our changing customers' demand. And that's been a big change for our business over time particularly with the cloud players, is not just sell general purpose compute that works for us, but sell custom compute by leveraging our general purpose capabilities that makes their lives better and helps them grow their business. That's really what we're focused on. And finally, despite the beat and the raise, uh, you know, fiscal year guide of a billion dollars higher than the street expected. The stock is down this morning. So some people must have doubts about the future. So I want to ask about competitiveness, process technology. You said that you're on track to launch 7 nanometer in 2021, and that's going to be competitive with your rivals 5 nanometer. Um, what are the risks that you see to that launch timing, and have they gotten less, or are they still the same than what you saw uh, when you took this job a few months ago? Yeah. Well, first, John, I'd kind of start with how, how we see the market and the role that we play in the market, because some of the challenges from our, from our success in the past, we generated 90% market share. So there's a worry that when you have 90% market share, the prospects for growth aren't that significant. We see the world in a completely different way. We see our served market today to be almost five times bigger than the CPU market that we participated in the fast. We see a $300 billion TAM. We're not just mm. developing and selling CPUs, but we're developing and selling XPUs which is a right. variety of architectures that allows us to play a bigger role. 
So we see ourselves with a relatively small market share with significant opportunities to grow with a set of technologies and capabilities that we believe are unmatched in the industry.